Across here is the Culloden battlefield. This is the Fraser burial stone. And this is the monument to the many others who gave their lives. But this monument doesn't even begin to count the number of lives lost in the conflict that I'm going to describe. I want to take you on a journey and ask you to think about Culloden in a way that you probably haven't done before. Will you come? If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Here they've had to lay a path along by the burial stones and it's all because of this one, the Fraser Stone. It had wear and tear compared to the others and that shows just how many folk come here because of a fictional character created by an American writer. And that makes me sad. Not because the writer's not talented or a creation compelling. It's not that I don't want people to visit Scotland. That goes without saying. It's just that the men buried here aren't fantasy characters in a novel. They're real people. And what came to an end here wasn't just flesh and bone. It was a whole culture and way of life. So why were they here? On the 16th of April, 1746, men of Athol, Camerons, Stuarts, Macintoshes, Farkersons, McLachlans, McDonalds and many more stood on the ground indicated by the blue flags you might be able to see in the background. They were waiting for their leader Charles Edward Stuart to give the order to charge. As they waited, cannon fire from the opposing side scythed through the ranks, taking off legs, decapitating bodies and creating death and destruction with no chance of getting your own back on your tormentors as you stood and waited. Lachlan McLachlan, the very man who was to give that order, was himself decapitated by a cannonball as he rode to call on Highland Gales, Lowland Scots, Irish, French and maybe even a smattering of English to charge. Last night's failed attempt at an overnight march to Nairn to surprise the opposition from behind meant that the men hadn't slept. Most of them hadn't eaten either. Eventually, they couldn't take it any longer and they charged over this ground, totally inappropriate for a Highland charge, towards the red-coated opponents who contained Highland Gales, Lowland Scots, English, Germans and Dutch. This was not Scots against English. As we'll see, it was way more international than that. And it was way more domestic than that. Charles Edward Stuart, who led the Jacobites, had been born in Italy. The opposing general, the Duke of Cumberland, was from a German family and had just returned from Flanders. And I suppose his reason for being in Flanders is the point of this video. But just before we start our journey, let me say that on the 22nd of November, Murray Pittock will be my guest for my monthly conversations with experts. Murray is THE expert on the Jacobite period, and amongst many others, he wrote the book Culloden. It is THE most complete account of this battle, and a new illustrated edition has just come out. I'll leave a link in the description below. Now, a video of our conversation where I ask your questions will be available on my Patreon members page. So if you're a Whiskey Patreon member, then send in your questions for me to ask and I'll put them to Murray on the 22nd of November. If you're not already a Whiskey Patreon member, then you can become one by clicking the white tab up there. Now, Whenever people talk about this battle, they talk about it as the end of a series of Jacobite counter-revolutions in support of the Stuart monarchy that started with William of Orange overthrowing James VII of Scotland and the Second of England in a coup in 1688. I'm going to ask you to think about it slightly differently. You see, in 1701, when the exiled James died, leaving his title to the British crown to his son, James VIII and III, or the old pretender, depending on your politics, there was another succession crisis going on. 
Spain was past the height of its imperial power, but the Spanish Empire still extended across the Americas, the Philippines and chunks of Europe. So when Charles II of Spain died childless, well, you can imagine. Now, he'd always been sickly, so you know the sharks had been circling for a while. He had two sisters. One had married Louis XIV of France, and the other had only married Emperor Leopold I, the Holy Roman Emperor, the two biggest kids in the playground. There may be trouble ahead. Look, I can't go into every detail of the various wars that are about to happen. There are more moving parts than a Swiss timepiece. And ironically, they were neutral. To simplify things at this point, let me give you three facts. One, to smooth over difficulties with this Spanish succession, Louis XIV, the husband of one of the dead guys, well, the dead guy, and also his main geopolitical rival, William of Orange, the King of Scotland, England and Ireland, agreed a treaty to divide the Spanish Empire, weakening it to their benefit and avoiding war. Two, when exiled James VII and II died, remember him? The French king supported his son James's claim to the British thrones in opposition to William. Ooh. Three, the Austrians of the Holy Roman Empire didn't give a stuff about British and French treaties or who was king of Scotland, England and Ireland. They wanted their man to be king of Spain. Can you imagine if the grandson of the French king was also the king of Spain? That's way too powerful a family. It was war. Now, during this war, the French sponsored an invasion into the British Isles to put their man, James the Eighth, Third, the Old Pretender, whatever. By now, the United Kingdom throne was to be his. Now, James fell ill and it didn't go ahead, but this was only a tiny part of the war that included the British, the French, the Spanish Empire, the Dutch Republic and more. Their imperial and trading interests throughout the globe meant that conflicts raged in Northern Europe, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, the Mediterranean, Indian subcontinent, South America, North America and the West Indies. In the process, some Native American tribes in Florida were all but wiped out, which might just seem like a sideshow in the passing, but that's exactly the point we'll come back to. Trust me. By 1713-14, everyone was spent like prize fighters, and they agreed a truce that nobody was entirely happy with. The British did get Gibraltar, more control of the seas, and the French acceptance of the Hanoverians as the new British monarchs, leaving the Stuarts out in the cold. Until the Spanish let them in later. The cost had been an estimated three quarter of a million casualties on all sides. They probably didn't even count the Native Americans. The truce was so unstable that four years later the Spanish broke it in order to get back some of the territories that it had lost. Now Spain was opposed by Britain, France, Austria and the Dutch, which is why it was called the War of the Quadruple Alliance. I'll tell you who was on the side of the Spanish, the Jacobites. When Spain launched a seaborne invasion, it was blocked in the channel in the south, but in the north, Spanish troops landed and joined up with Jacobite forces who based themselves at Elendoran Castle before losing the Battle of Glenshiel in 1719. But Scottish Jacobites weren't the only pawn in the Spanish crown. They also landed in Brittany in an effort to raise the Bretons against the French state. The French similarly used the Basques and the Catalans against the Spanish. Gales, Basques, Catalans, weren't really different from Native Americans in Florida. Have you ever wondered why there were no Jacobite uprisings between the one that ended at Glenshiel in 1719 and here at Culloden 25 years later? Here's a thought. 
The War of the Austrian Succession started in 1740. Charles VI, the ruler of the Austrian Habsburg Empire, died and there was a family tiff about who inherited the empire and who got that fish-shaped vase that always sat in the dining room table. Initially, the empire was to go to Charles' daughter, Maria Theresa, even although lassies weren't supposed to inherit. But when Charles died, it turned out that folks that had previously agreed to this changed their mind. What are the chances? A family feud became a major European war because it turned out the ordinary folks in Manchester, Salzburg, Hanover, Amsterdam and Moscow had really strong opinions about who should get that vase. And ordinary folks in Paris, Madrid, Stockholm, Naples and Berlin felt just as strongly in the other direction. And of course, the conflict crossed the Atlantic and extended to the Indian subcontinent. Who would have thought that all these folks cared so much about the provisions of a will written in Europe? Of course, I'm joking. The ordinary folks couldn't give us stuff. They weren't the people who'd be winning and losing. They'd be the people fighting and dying with big players of European power placing the pawns in the chessboard and sacrificing their populations based on self-interest. The on-off relationship between France and Spain was back on again, and part of the French and Spanish self-interest was an invasion up the Thames in 1744 to put the Stuarts back on the British throne. Now, when the invasion fleet didn't get out of Dunkirk, Charles Edward Stuart Bonnie Prince Charlie decided to go anyway. And by the time he arrived in the West Highlands the following year, the French had won a decisive victory over the Duke of Cumberland and allies in Flanders at the Battle of Fontenoy. Now, the fact that Bonnie Prince Charlie had raised a Highland uprising was an added bonus to the French because Cumberland had to leave Flanders cross the channel and head north until he sat astride his horse along this line of red flags representing the British Army troops where they fly today. His grandfather had been George Elector of Hanover, the first Hanoverian King of Great Britain. His grandmother had been Elizabeth Stuart, the daughter of James VI and I. In the interminable family squabbles of European monarchies and wars of succession, two cousins sat astride horses at two ends of this field to decide whose daddy would stride the stage of power politics in Europe. If the Jacobites had won, maybe a new alliance with the French. They didn't. And when the War of the Austrian Succession was finally settled and treaties agreed, the European powers involved still weren't happy with the outcome that they'd signed up to. And that led to the Seven Years' War. Now, our American cousins, I'll call them at the French-Indian War. In fact, it was the fourth French-Indian War because indigenous peoples had been dragged in to fight and die in every one of these European chess games. Or was it happy families? Either way, in this field in April 1746, real people were killed and an entire way of life died. When you think about it in the context of these geopolitical European struggles, it's no less haunting that the clansmen who died here were just another one of those indigenous people used as pawns in the greater European power play, just like the Basques, Catalans, Micmacs, Mohawks and others. In fact, I think it's sadder still. There's a video about an aspect of the 1715 uprising that people don't think about coming up on screen now. In the meantime, I mean, Dawkins can be a lamb alive. Cheery and drastic.